Good morning, Victoria Chinese Alliance Church. I am happy to be with you this morning, even if it is over video. My name is Cam Aiken. I'm the director of the Community Youth Ministry in Esquimalt, and I want to thank you and your congregation for your continued prayer and your continued uh, support financially of our ministry in a number of, of ways uh, during these, these times, even, even when their time, times are uncertain. You and your congregation have continued to partner with us, so thank you for that. It's my joy this morning to be speaking to you from the book of Hebrews. It's session four of Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's uh, online retreat for the English congregation. Uh, and it is also the Sunday, the Sunday morning service, as I'm sure you're aware by now. But uh, for those of you who weren't able to join us for the retreat, I'll just quickly talk, talk about, get you up to speed about the thing that we talked about over the last three sessions. We've been talking about retreating on Jesus. In session number one, we were speaking about retreating on who Jesus is as fully divine, as fully God, and how he is fully able to act in every situation. And even if he doesn't act in a situation the way that we want him to, that he is fully able to act and bring about for his glory and our good uh, the best outcome in uh, because of his love for us. So Romans 8.28 tells us that uh, that he is able to bring all things together for the good of those who loved him, who were called according to his purposes. Uh, and then we talked about in the second session how we are able to retreat on Jesus because he's fully human, how we can under he can understand what we've been through, and not just understand from a diff distance, but he's actually able to identify with what we've been through uh, because he's lived life as a human. So the one that we retreat on, the one that we retreat to, the one that we rest on and count on, uh, particularly in times like we're going through now, is one who is able, fully able, and also fully able to understand. And then last night, Saturday night, uh, we spoke about how we retreat on who we are in Jesus, how we're seated with him in heavenly places, how he has made us holy and that that's a finished work. Our, our position with him is a finished work and um, how he calls us not just into identity and a security in our identity in the here and now and in the future in our calling to, to be with him for all of eternity, our salvation, but he gives us identity, security, and calling into ministry. So we talked about how we follow him, not just retreating back on him, but how we follow him forward into the things that he's calling us to. And that's what we're going to be we're going to be focusing on a little bit today, how we not only retreat to Jesus or retreat back on Jesus, but we actually retreat forward with Jesus. We follow him into what he has for us. So we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. So Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 reads this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sing sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We're to follow after Jesus, the one who's gone before us. I don't know a whole lot about running. It's a marathon that's being mentioned here. I haven't done a whole lot of running in my life. But when I was a teenager, we had a hobby, something we do particularly in the summers for fun, my, my, a few of my friends and myself. We'd go cliff jumping. So we'd go to lakes, uh, Thetis Lake or Matheson Lake has some smaller cliffs and Souk Potholes has some really big cliffs. And we'd go cliff jumping. So we'd climb up these tall cliffs and then we'd jump off them into the water. But when you're going cliff jumping, you need to follow somebody who's gone before you, particularly at a place like Soup Potholes, where it's unclear how deep the water is and you don't know which the best places to jump in are. Uh, you want to avoid rocks down below. So you want somebody who's gone before you when you're when you're doing something like that. And the awesome thing that we can we can see about our God, about Jesus, who we retreat on, is that he's gone before us. In verse 2, we see that Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He's the founder or the author or the pioneer. The word that's used here is uh, a, a word, the word for pioneer is used for one who establishes a new city. So in the Roman world, when a city was getting too large or they needed more resources, there just wasn't enough space to contain the people that was there. They wanted to plant a new colony. They would send a pioneer out to start a new, a new village, to plant a new colony. And this is the, this is the word that's being, this being used here. So this, this individual or this group of individuals who are pioneers would go out and go before. They'd face the danger. They'd face the, the, the hardship. And then they'd invite others to follow them once things were established. So Jesus is our founder, our author, our pioneer 
near, he's gone before us. He's faced the ultimate hardship, and now we are able to follow him because he's inviting us to follow him. There's a difference between um, being invited to follow somebody and being told by somewhere, somebody to go somewhere. If you've ever seen movies, something like uh, Lord of the Rings or Braveheart or any, any movie where there's kind of a battle scene with knights and stuff like that, you've got two armies lining up against each other. And there's the leaders that stand at the back and they tell everybody, hey, go, hey, go there, hey, go do this. And then there's the leaders that lead from the front and they lead their people into what's next. And this is the type of leader, this is who Jesus is. This is what the book of Hebrews is telling us, is that Jesus has gone before us, he's leading us forward and we follow him into what he has next for us. We can follow Jesus knowing that he, God, not only sends us, but he goes before us. He has uh, not just sent us, but he says to us, come and follow me. Even when we are sent, we're not being sent somewhere that God has not already been. In these unusual and uh, difficult times, he's calling us to follow him through and follow him to what he has for us. I really, I really believe that after coronavirus has, has died down a bit, that I'm, I'm not sure exactly if things will go back to exact, the exact same way they were. And I'm not 100% concerned about all those things, particularly this morning. But I think that God's calling the church into something. I think there's been a stretching and a growing that's happened. We've become aware of, of new mediums and new challenges and, and even new opportunities. So as we go through coronavirus and we're out to the other side, perhaps, or whatever the new, new things will look like, we're not going to just be sent by God as if he's standing back here and sending us forward. He's actually going to be coming and follow. He, yeah, he's Sorry, he's gone before us and we're following him. He knows what's going to be happening around the corner. He knows the new things that he's calling the church into. And whatever it may be, we're going to be following him. He's already gone before us. When he is the pioneer and we are following him, it means that he's responsible for leading. We're responsible for following. But even our following is empowered by him. Uh, a university professor of mine, when he was talking about this verse, he talked about a... A giant uh, dog sled race that would happen I think it was in the Northwest Territories or some somewhere in northern northern Canada and there was there was this big dog sled race that would happen in the winter through the snow and he was talking about how you didn't want to be the one who went first because the one who went first would break the trail and sort of break through the snow and then everybody else would go on their tracks or if you've ever tried to go through a dense forest or dense bush and you know there's all these bushes and stuff the person who goes first has to break through all of that stuff so Jesus has gone before us he's broken through all of the stuff he's sort of sort of started to make a way and we follow him in in long distance races like we've talked about that theme continues in the book of Hebrews there's there's a marathon and there's a race that's talked about the person who goes first is often a pace setter and the people who are following behind them are following their pace or or even the person that's going first is, is sort of breaking through if there's any winds they'd be breaking through and everybody else is following that person so we're not only sent through difficult times but we're actually following jesus through these times not to, to survive but jesus is calling us into service and into ministry so our attitude is not one of saying to god okay, God, this is where I'm going, so I want you to bless me, or okay, God, this is where I am, so I want you to bless me. But our attitude is, okay, God, where are you, where are you leading? Where is your blessing? I want to follow what you're doing, Jesus. Particularly in these, in these difficult times, it's very easy for us to say, okay, God, I'm hunkering down and I'm staying here, or I'm going over here to stay safe and I just want you to bless me. Uh, he might be calling us to go into something new, or he might be calling us as the church tra transitions out into whatever this new phase of life is going to look like. And we want to be ready and willing to follow him, but also knowing that he's gone before us, that he's not just sending us into something that he'd be uncomfortable doing. He's gone before. He's the pioneer. He's the author. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that was set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Verse 1, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. The weight that we're being called, this is, this is sort of referencing uh, excess weight, everything that needs to be laid down, anything that's slowing you down in your pursuit of Christ. Uh, not necessarily outright sin, but things that might be uh, slowing you down, whether it's attitudes or the way you spend your energy or even the way you spend your time. 
I looked up online how much a sprinter's shoe weighs, and uh, what I found was that a sprinter's shoe weighs between 128 and 184 grams, so very light, very, very light. There's no space, there's no place for uh, extra things that are going to slow you down, particularly when we're talking about a marathon. I mean, it's one thing if you're running around the block and you're wearing heavy clothes, but imagine you're running for, I think a marathon is... 23 kilometers or something like that imagine if you're running that long and you've got a heavy jacket on or imagine if your race like is being talked about in the book of Hebrews is a lifetime and you're wearing and there's something that's burdening you there's something that's laying you down there's sorry something that's that's weighing you down over a long distance a small amount of weight becomes excessively heavy it becomes more tiresome and more wearing um when I was in my early 20s and, and late teen years I worked at a building supplies delivery place in Victoria and we would do drywall deliveries often and normal drywall is half an inch thick but there's um five eighths drywall that's just an eighth of an inch thicker and it's a little bit heavier but not I mean not not really not a lot heavier but there was one delivery we did for a whole um I think it was a couple of condo units that needed to the drywall needed to be redone in those units but the difficulty was that in that building, the elevator was too small to fit the drywall in. So normally we would just take the drywall on, on the elevator, we'd go up the elevator and walk the, the drywall down the hallway into the unit and, and put it against the wall wherever the customer wanted it. But there was the elevator was too small to fit the drywall. So in this case, we actually had to carry all the drywall, the 5 eighths drywall, all the way up the stairs. And it was it was quite a quite a long way and over over time we were we were sort of wishing oh we wish this was half inch drywall it's a little bit lighter but over this long distance back and forth it it got really really heavy and so it is this is what we're being called to when there's things that are weighing us down in our life and our pursuit of god in the race and the marathon towards jesus if there's anything that's weighing us down anything that's slowing us down we need to get rid of that excess weight Again, maybe it's not not necessarily outright sin. Of course, we need to we need to get rid of that of that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we need to cast off and get rid of anything that's sort of an extra weight that might be slowing us down or or draining us. How do we spend our time? How do we spend our energy? What hesitations or um, holdups do we have in what God might be calling us to consider? What is excess weight, and let us get rid of it. Not only do we get rid of the, the excess weight and things that are slowing us down, but then it, it proceeds, the writer of Hebrews proceeds to talk about the sin which clings so closely. So not just getting rid of that extra weight that's slowing us down, but the sin that's actively uh, clinging to us or trying to trip us up and trying to take us out. I mentioned earlier that um, my friends and I would do cliff jumping in the summers. And one thing you need to be really careful about is tripping. Because if you're running towards a cliff, and say the cliff edge is here, and the water is here, but there's usually some rocks or some shallower water right there. So if you trip, the momentum will carry you far enough that you'll fall off the cliff, but it won't carry you far enough that you'll make it into the water. It'll carry you into the shallower water or, or onto the rocks down below. So you need to be very careful about tripping. And the sin that's being talked about here is not... You know, the, the weight that's being talked about before is kind of excess weight that you need to get rid of, consider things that you need to not have with you when you're running this, this marathon. But sin is actually actively clinging to you, actively trying to trip you up, actively trying to entangle you and take you out, actively trying to stop you in your tracks to stop your marathon. The sin that clings so closely, the sin that easily trips us up, the sin that clings and entangles. When I played rugby for a short period of time in my young adult years, uh, there was a guy on the team that was way bigger than me, way stronger than me, way faster than me. And it was my job in one one of the practice drills, I was supposed to tackle him. Well, that didn't go too well. <laughs> I went to tackle him and I basically wrapped my arms around him, around his waist, you know, like as if I was going to tackle him. But he was too strong, so he just kept running. And I was actively hanging on to him, clinging to him. And the drill stopped and everybody had a laugh. But if the drill kept going, you kind of, I would have just kept clinging and my arms would have kind of slid down him and it would have tripped up his legs and stopped him from running. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying, that, that sin is actually trying to trip you up and stop you from running the marathon toward the one that you need to follow, even in times like this, towards the run that you need to retreat on, even in times like this. So in this marathon, what, sing, what sins are clinging to you? 
probably come to mind fairly quickly that sometimes the things that are excess weight we need to think about a little bit more but but the sin that's that's clinging to you that's entangling you that's threatening to trip you up or that maybe already has tripped you up over the last few weeks uh, bring that before the Lord confess it he's faithful and just and will cleanse you from all unrighteousness and also maybe in this time it's it's maybe a good idea that you that you speak to another brother or sister about it in the Lord and say hey this is something that I'm struggling with James says, confess your sins one to another and be healed. So maybe if it's, if, it, if it's something that you feel would be appropriate to share with, with a brother or sister, then maybe it's time to share that and not, and not get, not get uh, taken out, not have your race run, not get tripped up anymore, that sin that's clinging to you. Now this seems like quite a tall order to cast aside every weight that's holding you down and to cast aside every single thing that's, that's, that's keeping you in your life off, but we're even called after that to run the race with endurance. So we, we get rid of the excess weight. We definitely make sure we get that it's rid of the things that are actively trying to trip us up or actively trying to cling us, cling, cling to us. And then we run with endurance. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The endurance that's being talked about here is not just endurance in the physical sense as if you can run you can run for a long time, but it's actually um, enduring through suffering or enduring through gr- grueling circumstances. The same the same word is used in Second Corinthians when when Paul uh, talks about his enduring great suffering. Great suffering in Second Second Thessalonians, the words used about enduring persecution. In James 5, it's the endurance of Job, talking about a man who, who righteously endured this, this uh, intense suffering. In James 1, 3, it's talking about how the, the testing of your faith develops perseverance, or, or endurance is another word that could be used in English there. In fact, in the very next verse of Hebrews, in, 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 in chapter 12, in the next verse, we that we're we're about to look at in a couple minutes the verbal form of this of this word is used to describe Christ enduring his crucifixion so it's not just endurance in that you can run for a long time under good circumstances but the marathon we're being called to by God here to follow after Jesus is to follow through difficulties to endure and follow through grueling circumstances to endure and follow through everything opposition persecution, suffering, loneliness, discouragement, to endure and keep going through things that we might not want to go through, but God might be calling us to go through. And I think the coronavirus that's happening right now is is, is a small or big example, depending on what your circumstances are, where we're being called to go through something that we really might not want to go through. And yet, just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was able to say, okay, Lord, okay, God, okay, Father, your will be done not my will be done, your will be done. I'm willing to go through this thing that's going to be exceptionally difficult out of my obedience to you and my love for you. And so this is the type of endurance that we're being called to in this marathon because obviously you know in your life there's going to be things that God's going to call you to go through that you might not want to go through. But following Jesus, knowing that Jesus has gone ahead of you is such a great encouragement that we're actually retreating towards him. We're retreating forward. We're retreating after and following after the one who is fully able to transform situations, who's who is fully with us, who fully knows what we're going through and who fully identifies and has lived life as a human and is fully able to identify and to understand. So we get rid of excess weight. We particularly make sure that that, that sin that's clinging is dealt with, that it's been confessed to the Lord, um, that, we, that we've talked to somebody else, we've brought it into the light, that it's not hidden sin that gains power and grows on us. And that we run with endurance, knowing that there's going to be difficulties, knowing that there's going to be grueling circumstances or things that we just don't want to go through. But we follow Jesus through those things. This is a tall, this is a tall order. This is a difficult uh, thing that the writer of Hebrews is calling us to. And we might ask ourselves, how can I do this? How can this be done? And it's, it's actually right there in these verses. We run with endurance the race that is set before us, laying aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. It's right there, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, 
He's the one we're following. He's the one that we need to keep our eyes on. So we're able to do these things as we fix our eyes on the founder, as we fix our eyes on the pioneer of our faith. If we get our eyes off him, we get tripped up and fall. Uh, two weeks ago, Logan and I were walking down the, the stairs in our apartment. And obviously, he's a four-year-old. So obviously, like any good parent, over the, the past years of his life, it's every time you get to stairs, use the railing, use the railing. Logan, use the railing. But now with the COVID-19 and the coronavirus, it's the exact opposite. Don't touch the railing. Don't use the railing. Don't touch the railing. So he's walking down the center of the staircase in our apartment building. And he's not using the railing. He's totally fine walking down the stairs uh, without using a railing normally. But he's walking and he's looking forward. And for some reason, he decided he wanted to look back and watch the door close behind us as he was going down the stairs. So he walked down the stairs and he looked back and he tripped up and he just flew head first down the stairs. Thankfully, he was totally fine and he laughed about it. There's carpeting on the stairs, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but when we take our eyes off where we're supposed to be going, we get tripped up. When we take our eyes off the one that we're meant to be following, we take we, we, we get tripped up. I don't know if you watch the Olympics. I'm not usually a big Olympics watcher, particularly running, because I find races just, I don't know, it's just like you're running in a circle and I don't know. But I mean, the 100 meter race, you have to watch it. It's only 12 seconds so or less. So it's kind of an easy, it's kind of an easy thing to watch without getting bored. And Usain Bolt, the famous Jamaican sprinter in the, in the Beijing 2008 Olympics, you actually see him slow down at about 80 meters out of his 100 meter sprint. And he knew that he'd already won. He was way out in front. So he stopped running as hard as he could. And you see him looking around and starting to celebrate uh, before, the ra before the race is over. And he broke the world record, which was his already. He broke his own world record by doing that. But imagine if he'd kept his eyes on focused on where he should be going the entire time. He would have shattered that. He would have shattered that record. He would have run the best race possible. And so we, when we're running, we need to keep our eyes on the one we're following because we're not just running towards a, an end line, but we're actually running after somebody who's gone before us. So in this marathon, we need to keep our eyes on what we're running towards. We don't focus on the people around us. Yes, we need their support. Yes, we're cheering one another on as believers. Hebrews 10 tells us not to give up and not to forsake the gathering of believers, which I think is so important uh, even in this time. I mean, if you're listening to this, I'm happy and I... Uh, applaud you not because you're not because you're listening to me I, that doesn't matter but because you're gathering you're not forsaking gathering together you're not forsaking being encouraged and encouraging one another on towards good deeds uh, but when I'm saying we don't look at other people I'm saying in the sense of comparison we keep our eyes on Jesus we don't look we don't look uh, left or right to the circumstances that are going on or to what other people are going through we keep our gaze we fix our eyes on Jesus we fix our eyes and what and uh, on who he is no matter what is going on, the pandemic, uh, financial hardships, economic uncertainty, or maybe you're a university student and you, you don't know what the next year is going to hold for your uh, education, and maybe that that impacts your travel. Do I do I need to go back to another province, or do I need to make other plans internationally? Um, whatever it might be, whatever else you're facing, your eyes must be on him. Turn your eyes on him because you're running after him. You're following him as he leads. Whatever is going on, fix your eyes on him and follow after him. So how do we, how do we look to him? How do we keep our eyes fixed on him? How, what does that look like practically? Knowing the truth about him in each situation so being aware of what the word of god says about jesus in a situation uh, and that's part of the reason that i thought it was so important in this retreat that we kept the original theme of retreating back on jesus because we could we could talk and talk and talk about a pandemic and specifics about you know how, how a different bible verse might apply to that and i think that's good uh, but I think it's, it's, it's essential to keep who Jesus is before our eyes so we know who he is no matter what the situation is. Uh, we fix our eyes on him. We fix our eyes on the one who doesn't change when everything else surrounds us changes. Um, because Hebrews is telling us to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the one at the end of the, the, the race. He's the one at the finish line. But we keep our eyes on one 
who we were able to watch his ways, we were able to follow his footsteps, we were able to run like he did with an unstoppable assurance in the joy that was set before him. So we fix our eyes on who he is, but we also fix our eyes on how he's run the race. Verse 3 tells us to consider him and how he endured the cross. So we consider how he ran his race when he was on his earthly line. Uh, earth, earthly life. So, for, for for example, we're able to watch his ways and follow his footsteps. We're able to run like he did with unstoppable assurance in the joy set before him. He was so sure of what was waiting for him after death that he was willing to endure the most shameful and painful death in history, a form of execution that was that's so, so shameful that it was forbidden to be inflicted upon Roman citizens. So we consider the things that he went through. We consider that he was willing to do that because he knew what his future was. And, and we follow him in, with the same mindset in the same way. Uh, we carefully consider, the word is to consider, to add up, to carefully consider a careful analysis of what, of what he's done. And then that'll inform how we run our race. Um, I was one time asked, I, I ran into a, a, a pastor of a very large church on, on a ferry one time. And he kind of knew who I was, not very much. I definitely know who he was. But he'd seen me at a, at, a, at a pastor's meeting or something like that. And I, and I mentioned to him, oh, I'm going to a, to a citywide pastor's meeting um, in a couple of weeks. And he said, oh, you still go to those, hey? I, and he was, because he, he doesn't go to those. And, and I said, yeah. He said, well, can I ask you a question? He said, he said I don't go to those. He said, why, why do you go to those meetings? And I said to him, well, um, if I wanted to be a professional soccer player and I was invited by other professional soccer players that are much better at soccer than I was and they were gonna they were inviting me to a lunch and I was gonna you know see, see some skills that they have or talk to them about what it's like to be a professional soccer player I would go for sure and so I go to this this pastors meeting to be a part of the the unity of the body and also to learn from from these other pastors and to hear from them and see how they're see how they're doing ministry and he thought and then he kind of just said, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a, that makes sense. That's a good reason. And so when we're looking to Jesus, we're considering how he's run his race because obviously he's run the best race that any human has ever run. So we look to him, we consider, okay, how did Jesus face this situation? How did Jesus face uncertainty? How did Jesus run his marathon uh, of his life uh, after the Father's heart, after God's heart? So we know that there's things that are slowing us down. We know that there's excess weight in our life, whether that's our activities or our habits or how we spend our energies or our thoughts. And we need to consider what those things are and shed those things, get rid of the excess weight so that we're not slowed down in our marathon, particularly over a long period of time. We need to consider immediately the sin that might be entangling us, that might be tying us up, that's actively looking to trip us up and to stop us in our marathon of obedience, following after Jesus. We need to consider running with endurance, running through difficulties, running through uh, hardships and things that we don't want to face. We need to consider that. We need to look to and fix our gaze on Jesus, not looking to the left, not looking to the right, not considering uh, if this circumstance might undermine who God is. We know that he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We fix our eyes on him, knowing that he's gone before us, even in this time, this morning, he's gone before us, through coronavirus, he's gone before us, through whatever situation we might face. So we follow him. Jesus Christ is the one we look forward to at the finish line of our race. And Jesus is the one we imitate as we run towards him. So whatever opposition you endure, keep your eyes on Jesus. Whatever discouragement you endure, keep your eyes on Jesus. Whatever joy you experience, keep your eyes on Jesus. Whatever suffering you must endure, keep your eyes on Jesus. Look to him, follow him, and run to him. Amen.